In today's video, people are looking for missing loved ones, and they were found, thanks to psychics. You may not be looking for a missing person, but many of us are looking for something in our lives. I certainly was, so that's why I got a personal reading with an advisor with Purple Garden, who is sponsoring today's video. Purple Garden connects you with talented psychics, tarot, and astrology advisors. The advisors are all vetted and voted for by people like you. They have hundreds of advisors online right now waiting to enlighten, inspire, and empower you. It's easy to get a reading. All you have to do is create an account and choose the advisor most appealing to you. With Purple Garden, each advisor has recorded a brief introduction where they share their expertise, experience, and history. I love this because it made choosing the right advisor easy. With Valentine's Day, I know many people are thinking about their love life. You can ask your advisor, is that special someone thinking about you? Or what's next for your love life? Or if you're in a relationship, how can you make it stronger? Purple Garden even offers palm readings, angel insights, oracle guidance, and dream analysis. Once you find the advisor that best suits your needs, you connect with them how you feel most comfortable, whether it's via text chat, phone call, or video call. When I talked with my advisor, I had three questions. Who was I in a past life? Am I following the path my soul wants me to? And will I find fulfillment as I go on with life? The answer to my first question completely shocked me. Apparently, in a past life, I was a murder victim. I thought it was mind-blowing because the advisor has no idea I'm the host of a YouTube channel about the paranormal. As for the direction of my life, they said I was on the right path for now, but I shouldn't become complacent. There will be opportunities for change in the future, and while I shouldn't take every opportunity that comes my way, I should be open to new experiences. If I do this, I will find fulfillment as I go through life. Purple Garden has a great deal for paranormally listed viewers. Go to the URL or click the link in my description to get the clarity you need for a fulfilling life. As a new Purple Garden customer, you will get your first deposit of $10 match using my promo code Paranormally Listed. Get the answers you're looking for today and help support Paranormally Listed by checking out Purple Garden. Number 3. Nancy Weber Do you believe that psychics have the ability to find someone they have never met and who knows nothing about the case? What happens when they actually find the missing person alive? Is it a coincidence? Or a lucky guess? Or was it an actual psychic vision? These three cases may make you question what you believe. In our first case, a mother of three children had run into a dead end and nowhere else to turn. Deborah Keyes lived in Harding, New Jersey. After the breakdown of her marriage, her husband took her three children and ran off, leaving Debbie alone. Detective Lou Masterbone from the Morris County Sheriff's Office was sent to investigate. However, he didn't find many leads and the case quickly came to a dead end. Thirteen months after the parental abduction, Debbie heard a radio show talking about a psychic named Nancy Weber. Desperate to find her children, Debbie asked Detective Masterbone to accompany her to meet the psychic. Debbie and Detective Masterbone went to Weber's home. Skeptical, Detective Masterbone was about to become a believer. Weber is a former nurse who worked in the acute psychiatric unit in South Bronx. She ran the entire unit. As a young nurse, before she worked in the psychiatric unit, she had patients who doctors would diagnose with one ailment, but she would question them and tell them to do other tests for a different diagnosis. Then, when she turned out to be correct, the doctors would ask her, How did you know? Weber would answer, You don't see it? During her childhood, Weber did not know she was gifted with psychic abilities. She didn't know that she was different. She thought that everyone else had the same ability. Her first memory of her ability was when she was two and a half years old. A friend of her mother's was visiting when Weber saw a little thing in her belly that a voice in her head said to her, Baby. She repeated what the voice said to her out loud to her mother and her friend. The friend said, how does she know? I haven't even told my husband. Weber's mother quickly sent her out of the room. Growing up, Weber continued to blurt out things which made some people uncomfortable. 
She also claims that she's seen a lot of dead people. She never felt comfortable with the term psychic and was put off by the stereotypical image of the psychic world, so she went into the safe career path of nursing. It turned out that the nursing field gave her the confidence to become a psychic. So when Debbie and Dr. Masterbone showed up at her house, she was ready to help out. Debbie brought some of the children's shoes, clothes, and pictures and gave them to Weber. Weber then started giving specific information about the children's whereabouts. At first, Weber told her that one of her daughters had been attacked by a dog. The good news was that she was alright, but she did have a scar on her face. During the session, Weber said she saw the children in Ulysses, Texas. Detective Masterbone nearly fell off his chair. He was now a believer. During their investigation, the police followed the children's school records, and the last place they were enrolled was a school in Ulysses. Although they were enrolled there, they were taken out of school and moved away, and that was the last school records they found. After that, the detective had no idea where they went. But Nancy Weber had a vision. She said that they had moved to California and that they were in a city that started with the letter R. Detective Masterbo told Weber that California is a big state and they have lots of places that start with an R. After trying to get the name out of Weber, all she could do was give him a street. East Street. After about four hours, Debbie and Detective Masterbone were about to leave when Weber's dog, Ramona, came into the room. Detective Masterbone asked one more time for the name of the city. At this point, Weber was frustrated with him. She looked at her dog, thinking she wanted something, so she said her name, Ramona. Then, it came to Weber. The children were Ramona, California. Ramona is located about 35 miles northeast of San Diego, California. The next day, Detective Masterbone called the San Diego Sheriff's Department. But the Sheriff's Department initially didn't do anything. So Debbie called, and then Detective Masterbone called again. The Sheriff's Department finally decided to follow up on the lead. They tracked down Mr. Keyes to a house in Ramona. 1225 East Street. Unfortunately, Mr. Keyes was not there. He and the children had recently moved out. But, when talking to the neighbors, detectives were given a forwarding address. It was in Honolulu, Hawaii. With that information, Detective Masterbone went to a judge and requested a warrant for Mr. Keyes' extradition from Hawaii. Knowing the case, the judge asked Detective Masterbone if he was sure Mr. Keyes was in Hawaii because the information came from a psychic. Detective Masterbone said he was sure. He had the address and they were ready for an arrest. The judge signed the extradition warrant and Detective Masterbone faxed it to the Honolulu Police Department. Mr. Keyes was arrested and extradited to New Jersey. The children were returned to Debbie and the daughter had, in fact, been attacked by a dog and she had a scar on her face. No information can be found about Mr. Keyes after his extradition. Although this case had a happy ending, Nancy Weber has helped out with other cases that didn't end so well. One of the most famous cases she worked on was that of Elizabeth Betty Cornish, a 42-year-old nurse and mother of five who lived in Belvedere, New Jersey. On August 8, 1987, she was bludgeoned to death with a claw hammer. Blood was splattered all over the room. She was struck with the claw part of the hammer 21 times. The police initially suspected that it was Cornish's boyfriend, only identified as Paul because he was the one who discovered her. Plus, there were no signs of forced entry, but there were signs of a break-in. A window had been pried open. But the police thought that the window was pried open to make it look like there had been a break-in. They also suspected Paul because of the viciousness of the crime. It was clearly a case of overkill, so they thought it was personal. But the police couldn't find any evidence that connected Paul to the murder, so they didn't arrest him. Neighbors tried to help out, and they all agreed to take a polygraph exam. They all passed. 
With the case at a standstill, Cornish's family turned to Weber for help. Weber told them that she knew that the police suspected the boyfriend, but he was not the killer. The police brought Weber to the crime scene and she had a vision that the killer lived in the apartment above. She even named the suspect John and said his initials were J.R. A man named John Reese lived on the floor above Cornish. He was a farm laborer who lived with his girlfriend and two children. But Reese had passed a polygraph exam and he had an alibi for the time Cornish was murdered. Nevertheless, Weber was convinced it was Reese and she could explain why Reese had an alibi. The police had the time of the murder wrong. Ultimately, Weber was correct. She even led them to the murder weapon, which was in a pond on the farm where Reese worked. On August 26, 1987, John Reese was arrested for the murder of Betty Cornish. After a five week trial, Reese was found guilty of 11 charges, including first degree murder, and he received 110 years of prison. All thanks to a psychic. Number 2. Cat Gerard. On Wednesday, April 27, 2022, Jessica Larson and her adult son, Austin, were visiting her parents in Scandia, Michigan. Austin had been working on his truck in his grandparents' barn, but then he went missing. Jessica tried calling his phone, but it was dead. Jessica started to get nervous. She had a flashback to 2018 when her brother went missing. She didn't reveal if her brother was ever found. She told reporters it was almost like deja vu. It brought back the adrenaline rush. That night was going to be cold and Jessica was worried that her son would succumb to the elements. Nearly 24 hours after he went missing, rescue teams with canines, searchers, and other law enforcement resources were looking for Austin. However, they came up with nothing. Out of desperation, Jessica posted on Facebook about her missing son. After seeing the post on Facebook, Kat Gerard, a K.I. Sawyer, Michigan resident, sent Jessica a message. Gerard had known Jessica since high school. Gerard requested the address of Jessica's parents in the message, and Jessica gave it to her. Gerard then said to herself, I need a map. Gerard proclaims to be a natural-born psychic medium, and she said she's used her psychic abilities to help find missing people in the past. I'm part of psychic groups, and they post different missing people, and I've helped find other people before, Gerard told reporters. With her phone, Gerard opened her map and let her spirit guides hone in on an area in the woods. She drew a blue circle around the wooded area and sent it to Jessica, telling her that Austin would be found in the encircled area. Rescue teams have been looking in a totally different part of the forest. The day after he went missing, hours after the search began, rescuers found Austin in the exact location that Gerard has circled on the map. Jessica is grateful for Gerard helping with the investigation. My family and I want to say thank you, and we're extremely grateful for your gift as God sent. This is a miracle, said Jessica to Gerard. Austin was taken to the hospital in stable condition and was kept over the weekend for observation. I'm just glad Jessica listened to what I had to say and I'm happy Austin is in the hospital and getting better, Gerard told TV6 News, Market County. Number 2. Winnie Safransky On the night of May 21, 2018, 84-year-old Marlene Martin went to play bingo at the Elks Lodge No. 41 in Lockport, New York with her husband, Ronnie, and son, Kenneth. Lockport is located about 26 miles from Niagara Falls, New York. Marlene had dementia, and that day she was feeling tired and confused. That night at bingo, she went to use the restroom, but didn't return. Her husband and son realized she accidentally walked out of the lodge. They immediately reported her missing. Within hours, a search party was sent out to look for her. 
By 11 p.m. that night, a psychic named Juanita Safransky joined in the search for the elderly mother. For the past 30 years, Safransky has helped in over a dozen missing persons cases. Sometimes she's lucky and they find the person alive. Other times, she's not as lucky. When Safransky was 12, she was introduced to a New York psychic who traveled to Lockport to join other psychics in a seance at the Van Horn Mansion. They tried to make contact with the spirits of the dead in the nearly 200-year-old estate, which was believed to be haunted. The New York psychic sensed that Safransky had psychic abilities that allowed her to join in the seance. Safransky was the youngest person there. After that, Safransky honed her abilities and in the 1980s, she started volunteering as a psychic investigator. Safransky joined many searches throughout the Northeast United States. At some point, she started working with another psychic named Arthur Keecher. They started a business called Lockport Psychic Investigators. Safransky claims everyone is born with extrasensory perception, but they must train their mediumship to be fully psychic. Arthur Keecher agrees. He said, everybody is born with some gift at some level. It's like a muscle and how much you choose to develop it. Some of us really just keep wrapping around it and push it and go deeper and deeper. Marlene's daughter, Tammy, provides Savransky with a photo of her mother. While holding the photo, Savransky claimed that Marlene had suffered an eye injury. She also stated that she had prior issues with her heart and leg. She also sensed that Marlene was close to the elk lodge and, importantly, alive. Savransky felt that Marlene was drawn towards the water. So Tammy and Safransky spent the night walking along the Erie Canal hoping to find Marlene Martin before she wandered into the water. Unfortunately, during the all-night search, the police bloodhounds lost Marlene's scent. Drones equipped with infrared vision didn't pick up any traces of body heat. But shortly after the break of dawn, Safransky was drawn to a wooded area north of North Canal Road. Within a short time in the woods, around 9.30 a.m., Safransky came across Marlene in a depression in the tall grass. She was a quarter mile away from the lodge behind a private residence on North Canal Road. After being missing for about 12 hours, Marlene was in good health aside from an injury to the eye and leg. She even took a selfie with Saransky. The Martin family hates to think what would have happened to Marlene had Safransky not volunteered. If it wasn't for her, I probably would have never found my mom, Tammy told reporters. She didn't know me, and she didn't know my family. She just did this out of the goodness of her heart, Tammy added. Safransky said, locating Martin was just another day in the field. The only thing distinguishable about the search is the short time it took me to find Martin. This is what I do. This is 24-7 for me. It just comes that fast. Tammy considered herself a skeptic. However, after her mother's life was saved, she is now a believer. Tammy said, This lady is amazing. I can't thank her enough. In 2015, Safransky assisted in a search that made her locally well known. On December 30th, 2014, 42-year-old Paul Ford Sr. went missing. Safransky's abilities told her that Ford was near Anderson's restaurant in Lockport. She also predicted that he would be found beside a puddle or a tree and near a very small body of water. On January 20th, at around noon, two individuals came across Ford's body in a gully behind Anderson's restaurant. Foul play was not suspected in the death, Niagara County Sheriff's Office said. After that, Safransky silenced many critics and skeptics with her accuracy, which allowed her to help in missing persons cases that ended well for everyone. Thank you so much for watching this video. We hope you found it interesting. If you did find it interesting, please make sure you subscribe. We'll have a new video about the paranormal every week. If you just discovered this channel, please make sure you check out our other channel, Criminally Listed. We have over 325 videos featuring bizarre but true crime stories. You can find it at youtube.com slash criminally listed. 
We also have a podcast about cold cases that were eventually solved called Criminally Listed Presents Into the Killing. You can find it on Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, and anywhere you find great podcasts. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.